Hello and welcome back to the Algotistical Podcast, episode 47. Thank you for making it this far into the podcast. It's been a journey thus far with much further to go. So today what we'll be doing is basically discussing the Bitcoin blueprint that I've got. A segue from yesterday's episode, which was my Bitcoin strategy secrets, in which we divulged the following. There's four key things, okay, that we discussed yesterday. Number one, fundamental analysis. Number two, chart analysis. Number three, technical analysis. And number four, risk analysis. So just to strip back the bonnet on those topics really quickly, for the full 100, go back into yesterday's episode in which we do go to the nth degree on those things. But just to give you the quick um, recap, as it were, we discussed environment being stronger than our willpower, which is why we put so much credence on fundamental analysis. Now, underneath that umbrella of fundamental analysis, there is another four segments. So imagine a pie and you've got four quadrants of the pie. The four quadrants are as follows. Number one would be monetary policy, basically spearheaded by the Federal Reserve, Bank of England, the ECB, European Central Bank. Secondly would be the market sentiment. So, you know, human fear and greed, what's the vibes? That's number two. Number three is macroeconomics, both onshore and offshore. You know, what's the news saying, what the war's saying, etc. And then last but not least, number four, we look at other asset classes because other asset classes are correlated as a causation and a correlation with every single asset class. So what does that mean? We look at stocks and shares, you know, typical legacy stock market. Then we look at precious metals, meaning gold, silver, platinum, palladium. Then we look at, in isolation, the property market, meaning residential and commercial. Then last but not least, we look at cryptocurrency bollocks, okay? So just to frame it properly, that's number one, fundamental analysis. Number two is, you know, the chart analysis, which is what these podcast episodes are about, which is where we go into the charts. We look at multiple time fractal analysis on the kaleidoscope, and that tells us the actual picture without being biased onto one time fractal. So it just helps us form our thesis and it helps us narrate the story of the data a lot better. What we do here is data driven decisions. But in order to do that, we have to have data visualization at our fingertips, which is what I've coded with the trend volume indicators. So we simply go through that every single day, Monday to Monday, Sunday to Sunday, no days off. And that's to show you that I use my own code that I've coded to help me navigate the markets every single day. And it works with impeccable results. So I just want to be that sort of bastion to hold that flag and show you guys it's real. You don't have to be perfect to sort of work this out. You don't have to be, you know, top tier university educated. You don't have to be um, from a rich family or a rich background. You know, all you've got to do is have the right formulas, have the right process, have the right strategy. And over a period of time, you will prevail. Now, that goes into the third thing, which is technical analysis. That's what we discussed yesterday. Now, the professional framework that I adopt is the trend, volume, momentum, and volatility philosophy, meaning trend equals price action, volume equals instant dominance, the momentum equals oscillators, whether they're expanding or contracting, and equally with the volatility. Is that expanding or is it contracting? These are things that we can measure to quantitative precision with computing power. And that's our edge over Tom, Dick and Harry that want to speculate on the weekend, you know? Now, last but not least, this is the most important segment of my strategy, which is risk analysis, which is, in layman's terms, how you survive, no matter if you're wrong or right. So, vitally, there is four things underneath this. Number one, risk per trade. Typically, I'm risking 1% to 3% on any given trade setup, no matter how cocksure I might seem on the exterior. I'm only risking 1% to 3% of my portfolio because rule number one, do not lose money. Rule number two, do not forget rule number one, right? Buffett said it the best. I'm simply standing on the shoulders of giants and echoing the same sentiment. Success leaves clues. Um, if you've got 100 grand, you're only going to be risking one to three grand. If you've got 100 pound, you're only risking one to three pound. That's going to keep you alive when you experience a streak of losses because you will. You will experience losses. None of this market jazz is a dead cert. It's all probabilities and statistics. As Bayesian statisticians, what we do is manage our risk. Okay, that's what keeps us alive. 
Now, number two under this sort of risk analysis umbrella would be the risk to reward ratio. So typically I'm risking one to make two, specifically me personally. It's up to you what your risk to reward ratio is. We typically govern that a two to one, typically. One second here. <coughs> Excuse me, that sneeze was coming, baby. Um, so number number three, all right? Number three would be stop loss. You have to have a stop loss. One second. <coughs> Excuse me. It must be a uh, must be something in the air today. I must have um, I don't know. I don't know. I was going to think of a cool joke, but my dad jokes are probably going to fail me. So let's just leave those poor dad jokes to the side and stick to the synopsis. So in summary, again, risk per trade, risk to reward ratio and stop loss. So why do we put a stop loss in place? So let's say we're risking, you know, a sliver of our portfolio between one and 3%. We're looking to double our money. We still need to put a stop loss in place. Why? Because we can be wrong, okay? This is probabilities and statistics. So we need a cutoff point, a definitive cutoff point, okay? So what does that look like? We base it on market structure. We base it on recent swing highs or recent swing lows. Or we base it on volatility, meaning the average true range. You could do it on a multiple of volatility. And I think that's something I'm gonna show you right now, actually. I wasn't planning to do this. Um, but I'm actually gonna do this really quickly. Um, while I'm getting this up, what I wanna tell you guys quickly is position size, okay? I'm gonna make a video completely on position size in and of itself. So there'll be a designated YouTube video and podcast episode on this topic. Basically, the formula is this, right? Your risk per trade is divided by your distance to your stop loss, that is your max position size. And then if your nation state allows it, you can get leverage, but your acquirement for that leverage shall not exceed your position size. If it does, you're violating the formula and you're trading with feelings and emotions, and that's nothing more than gambling to me. Okay, that's nothing more than gambling when you put a flip on based on feelings and emotions. This is why we look at formula over feelings in every endeavor. So position size will always equal for me, my risk per trade in percentage format, divided by my distance to stop loss, okay? That gives me my total contracts that I can deploy. And then from there, if I put intensifiers on, whatever, right? But again, for you, that is like the um, X, Y, Z. You should focus on the A, B, C, right? Which is all the other stuff I've mentioned going into that. So cool, leave it there. So there is a tool that I've coded, right? Um, that I'm gonna show you guys really quickly. Um, what if we could get rid of something? Um, in fact, I'm gonna show you this at the end. I think this would be a good thing to show you guys at the end. I'm gonna quickly make a note on the side here. I've actually coded an indicator that can help you manage your liquidation levels, that can help you manage your stop losses a lot better systematically. And it's called liquidation levels, okay? I coded this a while ago. All of my subscribers have access to liquidation levels. Um, and it's something I do use from time to time just to keep me on the right side of the history books. So at the end of this video, that's something I will be covering with you guys. And I'm gonna show you how it looks on the chart. So let's discuss Bitcoin on a monthly basis, then a weekly, then a daily, then a four hour, and then I will sort of go back over that liquidation level indicator to help you guys draw the analogy properly. So cool, let's look at the monthly really quickly and let's dive into this. So looking at the monthly, what do we see on Bitcoin price action? We can see 58% buy pressure with 24 days and 14 hours until December's candle open. However, we are still underneath these dots here, which is the average historical norm. Again, that's approximately $37,000. So as long as we're underneath $37,000, I would still suggest that risk is to the downside based on the monthly macro data. However, contrary to that, we do have bullish volume on the monthly and we do have bullish momentum on the monthly. So perhaps that supersedes the trend somewhat, perhaps, okay? What we're here to do is just weigh up what we see based on observations. We're not here to um, get crystal balls out and start guessing the future. Right now, what we can measure is the volume being apeshit bullish, the momentum is apeshit bullish, and the volatility is expanding out of the critical territory. So ultimately, yeah, it's a recipe for price action discovery to the upside, okay? I don't make the rules, I'm just reading the algorithm. 
Okay, cool. So again, I'd want to see it above 37 though, for me personally to start slinging weight onto this market. I'd want to see it above 37. Below 37, I still think it's a little bit risky. Okay, a little bit too risky for me. Now let's pull up a weekly and let's see what the weekly is saying. So looking at the weekly time fractal, we can see there's six days and 14 hours until the weekly expires. We've got 96% buy pressure, which is very good. Um, it means the buyers are present in the marketplace, but let's reference this properly. It's the first day of the week and the first day is not even over yet. So the week can totally unravel itself. Thus far, it's incredibly bullish. But remember, with six days and 14 hours until the weekly expires, anything can happen. Literally, anything can happen, especially in this sport, in crypto. Um, it's, it's a bipolar, volatile market, right? So just because it's bullish today, doesn't mean it's going to be bullish tomorrow. This is why we look at multiple time fractals to weigh up the thesis. Anyways, um, the momentum. Let's discuss the momentum really quickly on this. So RSI is bullish, MACD bullish, Stochastics are bullish. And it's as simple as that, really, <laughs> right? We've got RSI in the critical territory for the first time in a long time. That can remain there for a while. The markets can stay irrational for longer than most people can stay rational. So the idea there is right now we are in the critical territory. I would look to start to aggressively, well, I'd start to aggressively suspect that price action will shit the bed when we get booted out the critical zone, which is at 80 read, right? Right now we're approximately 83. If we go below an 80 read, then we will be proverbially kicked out the critical zone, in which case I do think velocity will be picking up to the downside. In layman's terms, price action will drop, okay? The value of Bitcoin will be dropping this week, I believe. Um, but again, the trigger would be this red line going back to a yellow, which will be indicative of crossing back down underneath the 80 read, okay? This is coded automatically, so it will change color when it's time to change. This is why I've coded it, right? So it's not subjective. Well, I think this, you know, no, it's binary, right? It's tattooed on the chart. One plus one is always two, no matter if you're pink or blue. And again, as long as we're above 80, this will be red. As soon as we go under, it will change to yellow. And that's when I'll be looking for, well, a, a big debacle, let's just say that, a big sell-off, okay? Cool. Um, and that's the weekly. So I do put a lot of credence on the weekly time fractal holding weight, okay? Remember, each candlestick you see on the chart right now respectfully holds seven days of price action history. Um, we've got seven days stuffed into one candle. And uh, that's, that's good enough for me to put some thesis on. Cool, leave it there. Um, let's pull up a daily real quick. Look at the daily, look at the daily, look at the daily. Um, daily looks good, man. Um, let's reference this properly. So on Thursday last week, we had a new yearly high on Bitcoin. A new yearly high was formed last Thursday across Bitcoin CME futures and also Bitcoin index price action, okay? So anytime you see synergy across those two platforms, typically it does have credence. Now, since Thursday, we've been dropping on both CME futures and Bitcoin index. Um, and that's natural, you know, that's perfectly natural. I think what we're seeing now is possibly a consolidation, a reaccumulation, a redistribution, and then we'll continue the trend, okay? Um, so yeah, a bit of a crab market, they call it, a sideways market. Um, but yeah, that's what we're looking at here, right? So 93% buy pressure on a daily with 13 hours and 34 minutes until the daily expires. We are above all major moving averages, notably speaking the 21 day EMA, the 55 day EMA and the 200 SMA. What does that mean? We're above the exponential moving average on both the 21 day and the 55 day. And we're above the 200 simple day moving average, um, which is a more robust trend analogy. I think Paul Tudor Jones coined it the best. Paul Tudor Jones controls a lot of fiscal firepower. And what he said is this, guys and dolls, if a asset or commodity or anything you're measuring is above its 200 day look back period, typically it's in an uptrend. However, if it's below its 200 day look back period, typically it's in a downtrend. And this is observation analysis, you know, pretty simple binary bollocks. Okay, cool, leave it there. Um, now, let's look at momentum on the daily then, because there's a lot to say here. Now, momentum is in the critical territory. We do see RSI and stochastics. Um, however, stochastics are falling now. Okay, so stochastics are making their way out of the critical zone back towards the downside. 
um, and it will remain falling as long as the uh, Bitcoin underlying price action is underneath $35,820. Right now we are 35.1 approx. As long as we're underneath 35.8, velocity will continue waning to the downside on a daily time fractal on momentum. And that's something that I do think will start to seep into the weekly and the monthly synopsis. So let's keep an eye on that, right? As long as we're underneath 35.8, I have a hard time speculating to the upside. I have a really hard time speculating to the upside because not only do we have confluence on the stochastics, we also have it on the MACD, which is the moving average convergence divergence, okay? The moving average convergence divergence, better known as MACD, will continue falling underneath $35,850. So fundamentally, we've got two oscillators that measure momentum, all aggressively downside postured. Um, and yeah, I would uh, be very careful about that. You know, you don't want to be the man that went against the tide and died. You do not want to be the man that went against the tide and died. Um, so when we identify momentum of liquidity, we tend to go in the area of that. You know, we don't go against that. Cool. Um, and anything else I want to mention on topic here? Um, no, I think that does it for this one. Yeah, does it about, yeah, that does it. Cool, leave it. <clears throat> let's go to the four hour, baby. So four hour, let's look at the intraday level here. Um, the four hour is kind of interesting, right? Delicate, very delicate. I'm gonna zoom in on this to show you the delicateness. So right now we are literally bouncing on the 21 day look back period, which is textbook good. However, if we do go below the 21 day look back period, I would derive targets back towards the 55 day. The 55 day moving average is approximately $34,400. So we're looking at about a $700 shave on Bitcoin preliminary. $700 shave on Bitcoin preliminary first and foremost, which will take us to this line here. Then ultimately much, much lower over a period of time back towards the 200 day look back period, which is all the way back down to 30 Gs. So fundamentally, what this means, guys and dolls, is that Bitcoin can drop, th uh, well, it can drop, what, sorry, say that number again, mate. It can drop $5,000, right? So realistically speaking, it can drop $5,000. And I believe if it's gonna happen, it will happen before Christmas, okay? It will happen this side of Christmas. So yeah, just putting it out there for what it's worth, okay? I think the four hour will be bouncing the 200 day look back period, which is at 30K, okay? That's your that's your signal, if you like. Um, but remember, always conduct your own due diligence. Always conduct your own due diligence. Um, and I think that's good practice and ethical to say that. Anything else, baby? Yeah, so one thing I want to show you quickly is if we go into the settings of the Trend Volume Pro version 3 and we whack on our horizontal lines, which are embedded automatically, we don't need to draw anything on the chart. It will tell us exactly where support is and exactly where resistance is. Super easy, super effortless. So what this tells us here is this, we are literally back underneath resistance, right? So remember this white horizontal line here was the resistance. We had a draw on liquidity on the Thursday, which was the all time high this year, not ever. The ever all time high was back in 2021. We are still approximately 50% underneath the all time high ever, even though we hit an all time high this year on Thursday last week. So I just wanna reference it properly, okay? Um, now, at the end of the day, as long as we're underneath this horizontal white line here, risk is to the downside. If we manage to poke our heads back above and have a candle body closure above, remember, wicks do the damage, bodies tell the story. Wicks do the damage, candle bodies tell the story. So if we have a closure, which means we have a candle body closure above, that would be indicative of, well, you know, fucking bullish shit, really. Sorry about my French there. I'm trying to think of polite ways to word it but I can't you know so at the end of the day look if we break above 35.3 we are fucking bullish however as long as we're below 35.3 I would be very very conservative I would be very very much on defense when Tom Dick and Harry are trying to play offense we look at the theory and greed index we'll call it the Tom Dick and Harry index these guys are greedy right now man historically when Tom Dick and Harry are greedy smart money is off it right we should not be copying tom dick or harry they know not what they do they're copying people right they're sheep they're pigs and sheep and pigs get slaughtered and you have to you know understand this or you will be victim of this you have to understand this or you'll be victim of this you know the north remembers i used to be tom dick and harry i used to be anyways cool leave it there 
So again, look, I don't buy resistance. I sell resistance and I buy support. That's a simple plan, right? I'm a simple man with a simple plan. We sell resistance, we buy support. Um, and at the end of the day, that's what it is. Um, so cool, I think that's fine. Now I did promise you guys we'll be looking at another indicator called the liquidation levels. So let's quickly do that. Um, liquidation levels, here you go. So this is a real cool indicator, right? So all of my subscribers have access to this, right? Let's move this label somewhere. Um, bottom, okay, let's go to top right. Awesome. I don't know if you guys can really see this. It might be a bit too small. Um, in fact, let's make it to the bottom right. The bottom right, there you go, cool. So yeah, what I might do, I might go into the back end of this code and sort of make this table parenthesis huge so you guys can see it properly. But at the end of the day, this is what we're looking at, right? These lines are basically the average true range, which is basically a volatility metric of price action. The average true range was made by a guy called J. Wells Wilder, who was the same chap, the same gentleman that made the relative strength index almost a hundred years ago, okay? So this is some proper old school algorithm, you know, it's not no new age bollocks. Um, so the average true range is a similar thing to the relative strength index, but slightly different. Now, all you need to know is this. Um, if we click onto the table, we can see here that the volatility scale factor is set to three. So what that means is we've got the volatility period set to a 14 day look back period, and we are timesing the volatility by three. Okay, so that's what gives you these lines here. So you can see the top line, I might need to make that a little bit thicker so it really pops. Okay, let's make it bright as well. That's better. And let's make this, this color, there you go, cool. Can everyone see that, right? So what this means is this, our long liquidation is set at 34,000, sorry, um, 30, I beg your pardon, 36,000, right? So if we short the market, right? So we short the market here, our stop loss would be at 36 Gs. Why? Because it's three times the average true range on a 14 day look back period. That's why. Um, so yeah, if we short the market here, I'd be set at my stop loss proverbially, proverbially? Can't get me words out, dude. Dyslexic AF. But I'd be set at my stop loss three times the average true range. Okay, so again, 36 Gs. The average true range, by the way, is um, $1,100. So yeah. Does that make sense? I don't know if this is making sense, dude. Um, let me just double check the nuances here. Scaling factor, yeah. Okay, cool, is what it is, man. So yeah, generally speaking, yeah. And then if you go to the bottom one here, this is 34,000, so if we're along the market, right, the stop loss would be at 34 Gs, and if we go underneath 34 Gs, you'd be liquidated. So this is why the indicator is called liquidation levels. This might be a bit of a, your head a look for some of you people. Um, especially me being on coffee and um, jittery talking away through it. It doesn't, it might not resonate with you, but um, for those of you that are familiar with the average true range, and those of you that are familiar with liquidation regions and volatility, this will be like, ah, oh, yeah, we understand it. But if not, don't worry, because I haven't explained it properly at all, to be honest. But um, again, hopefully it does make some sort of sense. You can always make notes on this, right? So if I was making notes outside looking in, I'd be writing down ATR, which stands for average true range. I'd be going on YouTube and I'd be searching the average true range videos. Uh, I'd be going onto AI and typing into AI average true range. Tell me more about it. Tell me the 10 key things. Really, I should have done that for this video and prepared properly. Um, but again, this is your homework. You can go conduct your own due diligence. I'm not gonna spoon feed you every single effing play. You have to go do some research and do some legwork yourselves um, because it will attract the wrong crowd. If I'm just sitting here preaching malarkey, I don't want you to take it for gospel. You need to go out there, do your own research, do your own homework and draw your own conclusions. But I'm telling you now, this is ironclad. You know, this is super ironclad. Um, anyways, I'll leave it there. How are we doing for time? 24 minutes, a little bit too long. I'm gonna try and start getting these videos down to like 10 minutes, maybe eight minutes. Um, so forgive me for rabbiting on and letting my mouth loose. Um, so I'm gonna rein it in here. I think we're pretty much done now anyway. Um, Bitcoin is looking kind of bullish. Okay, I'm not gonna lie, summarizing the thoughts here. Bitcoin is looking kind of bullish. I would still be very careful. Um, I don't think we're out the woods by any stretch. Um, and also just to round off later this week on Wednesday, we do have the Bank of England coming out with new monetary policy. 
the same very day we've got the Federal Reserve Jerome Powell mouthpiece coming out discussing their monetary policy. What does that mean? It means America and the UK are coming out on the same day discussing monetary policy. Typically they echo each other. So what does that mean? Volatility is expected on Wednesday. I do expect a, a reaction in the fiscal realm on Wednesday because we've got a lot of moving parts, a lot of moving variables, both onshore and offshore on that day. Um, and that does have an implication. Now, we also do have UK GDP, I believe on the Friday, um, going into, I think it's Thursday or Friday. Let me just double check that on my calendar here. Yes, so it's Friday. So we've got UK gross domestic product month on month coming out on the Friday. Now that does not have a direct impact on Bitcoin, right? But what it does have a direct impact on is the economics, right? The macroeconomics, which does have an implication on asset classes, which does impact Bitcoin. So, you know, it's a inverted correlation, as it were. So just pay attention, man. I think Wednesday will be volatile. Um, Friday, you know, just be cognizant of what the GDP print is from the UK. And that's about it. We'll keep our fingers on the pulse as always. And I think that just about does it for this one. So have a great start to the week, guys and dolls. Remember, always manage your risk. Risk is paramount. As traders, you have to think in terms of probability and statistics. Otherwise, you are purely gambling. And I think that just about does it for this rendition. So thanks for attending. God bless you. Respect. And I'll see you tomorrow.